Welcome to Lecture 17. <laughs> so today we're going to be talking about opinion and sentiment mining. And even though this is uh, just a, going to be an hour-long lecture, this really should be an entire course. So we're not going to go way down into the algorithms. But I want you, at the end of this hour, to have a good sense for what is opinion and sentiment mining, a bunch of the issues that come up with it, and some ways you can use it. So I don't know if anybody is going to be using this in their data analysis uh, project for the class. We'll, towards the end, I'll talk about a particularly simple way you can do this kind of uh, sentiment analysis. But it's not a prerequisite for the class. But it, I just want, this is an important topic, so I want to make sure we cover it. Today's text is um, this big 130-page document, um, which is basically a small book uh, called Opinion Mining and Sentiment Analysis. Like I said, this is a whole big topical area. And this really is, uh, this is from, what, 2008? People have been doing this for a long time. People have been worrying about how do we, how do we extract the sentiment of a tweet, or the sentiment of an email, or the sentiment of a whatever. And so there have been algorithms and methods and analysis. The bottom line for this is it's harder than it looks. Because you would think initially, why can't I just count up the number of times people say positive words or negative words or whatever? But the truth is, it's tricky, and we'll talk about that. I will let you know, for people who are inter interested in this topic, the Wikipedia article, there's the link right there, it's actually pretty decent. And it, does, it, like, it goes into a little bit more of the algorithm stuff. But like I said, this is a whole big topic. We're just going to cover the top of it today. So let's start. So what is text mining generally? And I, I bring up that term because it's kind of a super category for all of this. So there's sentiment analysis and sentiment mining and, and opinion mining and opinion analysis and so on. Generally, this is all part of a larger field called text mining or text analytics. And the problem for this area is to extract high quality, high quality results or high quality uh, pieces of data from text. So unlike natural language processing, where it's all of natural language, this is just data extraction. So what sometimes you will hear called data datafication. And so basically, it's kind of what you think it is. Um, it's trying to extract opinion and sentiment accurately from the texts. And we'll be talking about what it means to be accurate. But identifying the sentiment of a text, and so what does that mean, right? Is it just you can detect when somebody is screaming, or is it more subtle than that? Okay. So let's give you some examples here, some reasons why you might want to do this. So the movie business, the computer game business, these are all big businesses that run on reviews, basically. And so you can see reviews like this one here, thumbs down, this, this review of a movie or the game is an unbelievably disappointing. Or somebody could say it's full of zany characters and satire and so on. So you see all these kinds of comments. How can you write the piece of code that will categorize each of these correctly? Okay. And as you can see here, part of what's interesting about this is you, you, you get something like, this is the greatest screwball comedy ever filmed. Well, it's difficult. It's probably not overtly true, objectively true, because the definition of the, you know, the greatest of anything is a very subjective categorization. So how do you do that? What do we do? So we do sentiment analysis because there is a giant number of different kinds of businesses that rely on the reviews in order to sell their product. It's also interesting, you'll see in a second, for doing sort of modeling and prediction of markets and so on. And importantly, we can see things in the political landscape. Um, you know, the number of tweets, the sentiment of the tweets is really interesting. And in many ways, the sentiment is a subtle measure of what's going on in the political landscape. And of course, we, if, you know, if you're going to deal with that, you have to think about prediction. So from the United States perspective, what was going on in, in the Twitterverse in terms of the sentiment during our last election was extraordinarily interesting. Not the actual numbers, because the actual numbers were not revealing, but the sentiments were. So let me give you a couple examples here. So here, for example, is a typical, uh, this is from Bing Shopping. 
So you could see here, this is a particular HP multifunction printer. It's got the data, like the price and so on. But below that, you have the star ratings. And there's a couple of things I want to point out to you. So first off, you see these stars here. So these are five star ratings. And this one has 55, five star, 54, four star, and so on, so on, right? You see that. There's two things to notice here. One of which is when people give stars, they're explicitly saying this is a four star, four and a half star, whatever it is, rating. And you can see here the actual average rating out over 144 reviews is four and a half, basically. What's interesting about stars is that they are kind of a summary evaluation by the person. And you actually don't know the more subtle details. For that, you have to actually go over here to column two, where people mention performance or ease of use or whatever it is. These are different factors that are extracted from the texts that are written in the review. So Bing has a, 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 a sort of category of property of the device and extract that. And so these, we'll talk about how to do this in a little bit, but these are basically bigrams and trigrams, unigrams, that are extracted as being most commonly mentioned. Now, how do you do that? We'll talk. We'll get there. Compare that with, for example, the Google Shopping thing for the same device. Here again, uh, we have uh, a number of reviews, and we have a different visualization, but it's the same idea. What I find interesting and somewhat amusing about this, this is actually an old diagram, but I'll show it to you because you see up here it says five stars. You notice they don't use stars. <laughs> there are no stars on this display. But what's interesting about this is these category terms over here are, this is, now I'm going to switch back and look at the Bing shopping. Okay, here it most mentioned is ease of use. Well, oh, sorry, performance, then ease of use, then print speed. On the Google one, it's ease of use, value, setup. Print speed never shows up. So what's interesting about this is that even though it's the same product in roughly the same time period, people get very different kinds of, of responses. Of course, today's Google Shopping is a different, different, wholly different kind of UI, but it has exactly the same components. It's got these extracted terms, these quotes over here you see on the right-hand side. These are quotes that are extracted that support this thing. For example, we have this, this algorithm that extracts comments about customer service. So that's product. So you can imagine lots and lots of different kinds of products that work like that. But sentiment is also used in looking at what's going on, for example, in consumer confidence. So here, the black line in this graph is the Gallup poll. This is a big poll in the United States where they survey people and they ask about consumer confidence. Are you very confident you know, uh, or less confident that the, uh, the economy is doing well? And you can see that if you look at Twitter sentiments analyzed in this paper you see on the left-hand side by uh, O'Connor, Balasubramani, and uh, uh, Rutledge and Smith, you can see that, in fact, <clears throat> except for this period right here, right, it's actually pretty predictive. And so what's interesting here is that this is a period of, of great uncertainty. And what people were tweeting, and this is back, you know, this is a while ago, right? This is like 2008. This was a, kind of a noisy signal, but, but around September 2008, we see this huge economic collapse, basically, when, when Lehman Brothers, the big uh, 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 stock market play, fell apart. And so you see, this is actually really interesting, because in essence, what people are writing about in Twitter reflects, or in some cases, predicts what will be happening in consumer confidence. Here's another kind of, the same kind of analysis except done with the predictions of the stock market. And so you see here, each horizontal stripe, each horizontal band, is a different kind of property. And so what you're seeing here, this vertical line is, um, this is 2012 now, this is not last year, this is uh, uh, four and a half years ago. You can see the day, you can see these different kinds of results reflecting the amount of, the amount of sentiment expressed as calming terms or alerting terms or being sure about what was going on. and so. Here we have one, two, three, four, five, six different kinds of sentiments that are being analyzed. And the opinion finder, again, is sort of the gold standard. This is what people are saying. And you can see we, these right here, this peak, 
about how vital people are feeling about the, the stock market, how, how active it's going to be. They predicted that mm, about two weeks before the actual election. Again, not a huge surprise, but we see that when you do this kind of Twitter sentiment analysis, you start to see other predictors. Of course, you know, if you're a company, you would love to have an automated tool that would look through all the tweets and all the Reddit posts and everything about your company. And United Airlines has had a, a, but a bit of bad trouble recently, and it's reflected in their, in their tweet stream. So we see the, exactly the same behavior, even though this paper is from 2009. So this is uh, Twitter sentiment classification using a particular method. We're not going to go into the method today, but you see what happens, right? Here they've got a database of tweets, and they want to look for the sentiment that has, for example, this term in it, United Airlines. And you can see, you know, they got a bunch of bad press here. This is even true in 2009. Full disclosure, I don't work for United Airlines. I, I do fly them, but, you know, it is what it is. The point for us is that this sentiment analysis is really important. If you've got a business that relies on customer interaction or customer satisfaction, having accurate Twitter, Twitter sentiment analysis is really, really helpful. Okay, so again, to reiterate, this, this, this whole area is known by multiple different kinds of terms. So it's sometimes called opinion extraction, opinion mining, sentiment analysis, sentiment analysis, or another term you'll sometimes see is subjectivity analysis. And that's a holdover term from, from like the pre-80s, 1980s, when people would do subjectivity analysis of, of pieces of writing. That's basically a psychological idea. Now, the reason I bring that up is because there is a pre-existing body of knowledge about different kinds of affective states. So this guy, Klaus Scherer, uh, wrote this paper back in 1984 on different kinds of components of act, affective states. And there's a bunch of them here. I'm not going to go into them all. But there are different emotional states, different kinds of mood states, interpersonal stances, and so on. And the one we want to focus on is this uh, fourth one here, attitudes. Okay, so attitudes are basically what we're measuring when we do opinion mining or sentiment analysis. We're looking for markers in the text that tell us the attitudes people are holding towards the companies, the products, the films, the restaurants, whatever. And we're trying to extract out those attitudes. So this changes our question from how can you just analyze text to how can you determine attitudes based on the text. So this is what sentiment analysis basically is. <clears throat> we're trying to detect those attitudes that we saw here. This is the sharer kind of thing. We're trying to look at what attitudes people have. And in particular, we have four things we want to identify. We want to identify who the holder is of that attitude. That is, usually that's pretty easy because it's it's a just a, a, a Twitter handle. But as people who are doing data analysis projects in the class sometimes find, you know, sometimes you can find multiple identifiers for the same person. So having the same attitude. So identifying the person who's making the tweet or expressing the opinion about the sentiment is useful. So that's thing one. Thing two is to identify the target, or sometimes called the aspect, of that attitude. So in the previous example, the target of the attitude was United Airlines, right? So you need to identify the, tar the holder, that is, who's creating it, who's the source of that attitude is, and what they're talking about. That's not always obvious, especially in longer texts or even very short texts, uh, it, you have to figure out who they're talking about, what the target is. Third thing we want to figure out is the type of the attitude. Now, there's a large, gigantic set of possible attitudes you could have. We don't care. For the purposes of this analysis, sentiment analysis, but for this kind of work we're doing, it's really a classification into a predetermined set of types. So the types of the attitude would be, you know, our anger, uh, joy, uh, feelings of, of, of nostalgia, whatever it is. So we will predetermine that type. 
This is important because a lot of machine learning techniques use this as their basis, basic method. You give it a complex input, and it just classifies it into one of n different kinds of types or n different categories. <clears throat> now, the, the, the fourth category here, the fourth kind of thing we, we care about is what we think of as polarity. So, in other, in other words, you can, you can be very positive about a particular topic, and you can measure that strength. So it's a little bit like we were talking about earlier, about strong ties and weak ties. This is positive attitudes, negative attitudes. So for example, I could, I could be angry plus nine about United Airlines. And of course, then there's the, the text, of course, that, that thing. So in essence, for social computing, for this class, the perfect tool would be something that would process a set of search results for this particular item, this particular topic, and generate this set of attributes based on what we just saw. Okay. So, like I said, there's a lot of lot of particular applications. So, a really common one these days is recommendation systems. So you'll see this, for example, in movie review sites or digital camera sites or Amazon. People who buy this often buy that. And so it's recommending based on the sentiments expressed by other people. So people who bought this particular camera leave a review saying they love it or they hate it. And so that becomes input to the recommendation systems. If you're running a website or a forum, you also want to be able to do flame detection and, it, for example, start to automatically exclude people who are acting like trolls. Remember trolls from a couple of weeks ago? Although we're not going to talk about today, this third one of doing information extraction is another really kind of important topic. Again, not today, but later. The last big use is for ranking of search results because, especially in these subjective topics, like which, uh, say, uh, electronic dance music band is best, trust me, there is no objective result for that. However, people have very strong sentiments that they express in their reviews, in their um, uh, basic texts about it. So how can we use that? So let's talk about some of the issues that come up here. The biggest one is that a lot of this data is incredibly subjective. People will say something like, the design is tacky. Well, you may think it's tacky, but I think it's gorgeous. I think it's beautiful. Or the two different customers may feel that a customer service was condescending. The next person may think it was fantastic customer service. So reviews like, you know, this was icky or whatever is very subjective. But that's both the, the, the annoying thing about this data set and the beautiful thing about this data set. We have to figure out how to then take these pieces of, of subjective data and combine them in useful ways. So when we do sentiment analysis, there, you could think of it as a kind of a number of levels of complexity in the analysis. The simplest one is just, can you figure out if this text is positive or negative? Okay, A little bit more sophisticated one would be to rank it from 1 to 5 or whatever, give it a score. And of course, the advanced one would be, as we talked about earlier, doing the target detection of source and, and so on. So let's look at this, for example. Here are two movie reviews. I don't remember what the movie is. Something. Uh, but the one on the left gave it a terrible grade. F. In, in U.S. scoring system, that's terrible. It's the worst you can give it. On the other hand, the movie on the right gets a positive grade. The thing about this is the way in which it, you look at the terms, they both say, I love this movie. Right? If you just count words like positive words like love or negative words like hate, then the first one, the one on the left, basically balances out. So simplistic word counting doesn't work. Another factor in a lot of these analysis things for sentiment or opinion mining is that some of these texts get very weird and very complex. So for example, here's a phrase. I love this movie when I was little. So the first part phrase there is a very positive phrase. The second part is a neutral phrase but in the context of movie reviews, it's negative. Assuming you're an adult. Oh yeah, okay, you see where we're going with this? It gets complicated. Look at this. 
on the right hand side we say I love this movie it was really I don't know what that means but if you say it out loud it's so really oh really spell correction oh my gosh you're kidding we have to spell correct all this stuff too so you know this is a particularly interesting one because it has a lot of spellings errors and it's also <laughs> full of text like this apparently I have to write 30 words um, <clears throat> I know you never did that as a student <laughs> But there are students who add filler text like that. So it gets complicated. Here's a famous book review, book commentary by Mark Twain, who wrote that Jane Austen's books madden me so much that I can't conceal my frenzy from the user reader. Is that a positive review or a negative review? So the two bold words here are madden and frenzy. And you would think, well, it's great. We'll just count up the negative words. But it gets difficult. Here's an analysis done by our authors today, uh, Bo Pang and, and Lillian Lee, where they basically tried to get people to write down terms that were positive or negative. And they basically classified these using keyword lists, so by, created by humans. So there's no automation here at all. And the interesting thing about it is how often terms could appear in either positive or negative. Okay. So what's fascinating about this is that the humans, so we take human set number one, that first row, I look at human set number two, and the accuracy is 58 and 64%. That's really low. It's not great. And the number of ties is, is quite high. Interestingly, if you just run it through a plain old statistical classifier, you'll get much better results, much better accuracy, much, much fewer ties, which is what you want. Interesting, interesting point. Look at this. Question mark and exclamation point are terms that are pretty predictive with respect to sentiment. They are never mentioned by humans. So this is one of the reasons why doing this kind of analysis is really important. And as I say on the left-hand side, there are sometimes terms that are very difficult to classify because here you say, the review is, it was a dazzlingly vapid performance. So the word vapid means kind of meaningless and empty and useless. But it's right next to a really positive term. So is that sentence positive or negative? This is the problem of sentiment analysis. Now, we do have sentences like this. If you are reading this because it is your darling fragrance, please wear it at home exclusively and tape the window shut. There are no positive terms, there are no negative terms. Yet, it's clear that this person hates the scent of this fragrance, that this is a terrible perfume experience. So there are no negative words in this, but we still want to extract the sentiment. Here's another one. This is Dorothy Parker who's talking about the actress Katherine Hepburn. She said, she runs the emotion of gamuts from A to B. This is another example, and, it, and I'm bringing it up because it's a beautiful example of how much real-world knowledge you need to do and you need to have in order to do this accurately. This is, this particular example, is beyond the current state of the art, although we're starting to see examples where stuff like this can be po possibly be done. We're not going to talk about that today. That's in the realm of artificial intelligence. But you see, in English, you would normally say someone has you know, a range from A to Z. A to B implies that it's incredibly limited. So this is a very, very subtle negative comment. Now, this kind of knowledge, this kind of real-world knowledge becomes important because the context of the review, and by that I mean, is this a review of a movie? Is this a review of a computer game? Is this a review of a hotel or whatever? The framing that is the context determines the interpretation of the sentence. So here, if, the, if you read in the review, go read the book. If it's a movie review, this is incredibly negative because it implies that the book is much, much, much better than the movie. You can see where this, right, where this kind of thing is. There also, and this is, you know, this is a long list of things that make this kind of analysis hard. Here's one on the order of text effects. So we've been talking about positive terms, negative terms, symbols like question mark and plus and uh, exclamation point. 
but some things matter depending on the sequence of text. So here I've got a review where all the terms are very positive. This film should be brilliant. It's a great plot. The actors are first grade, meaning first rate. Supporting cast is good, and he's delivering a good performance as well. The last sentence, however, negates the entire preceding paragraph. However, it can't hold up. So this, the overall value of the sentiment of this paragraph is negative. So if you just add the positive terms, the negative terms, this looks like a positive statement. But the overall sentiment of the paragraph is negative. And like I said, common sense actually makes a fair bit of, I'll tell you the good news. The, the good news is we don't care about this too much. The bad news is sometimes it's really important especially in short reviews. So, for example, talking about the previous movie, somebody wrote, Stallone is firing on one cylinder. That doesn't sound particularly negative, except for the common sense knowledge that automobiles or motorcycles typically have more than one cylinder. And so if someone is firing on one cylinder, that's a derogatory negative comment. Similarly, the second one about Harrison Ford is a superbly monotone actor. Again, a positive word and a, and a neutral word, but the neutral word is a ne has a negative effect in the context of movies. And I like this last one. <clears throat> Those two sentences here are very, very similar. In a review of a hotel, someone might write, <clears throat> they would not let my dog stay in this hotel. That's totally fine. It's a slightly negative comment because they didn't allow my dog to do it. Versus someone who would write, I would not let my dog stay in this hotel. That is an intensely negative hotel review. It's not even fit for my dog. So <clears throat> let me just glide over this quickly because this is more examples from IMDb, um, again, from the same article we've been reading. The text on the left is complex and doesn't have a lot of positive words in it, but it's a very positive review. And the text on the right, same way, it's a very negative review even though it has relatively few negative terms in it. So what do we do? So there are lots of different kinds of classifiers that you can use. Again, we won't go into this a lot. I'm just going to mention a few of them. Um, there's a, a scalar, scale vector, scalar vector machines you can use, naive, B, naive, Bayes, and so on. There's a bunch of these different kinds of algorithms. If you're interested, I would direct you to the Wikipedia article, because they list a bunch of those classification algorithms and then give you pointers to more detail in the text, so you can go read about that. But they all work on two key steps. They first take the text and they tokenize it. They break it up into the, into the components. This is an important feature, and we'll talk about why in a second. But you take the text, break it up in these tokens, you then run your feature extraction, and then you run your classifier over that. So it's a three-phase process. Tokenize, Extract, classify, and use whatever classifier you want. But the tokenizer step is important because in most applications, you have to deal with both HTML and XML markup systems. And there's a bunch of things that different channels of data like Twitter or Instagram or whatever, Google, give you. For example, Twitter has a bunch of markup in their stream, in their data stream. And unlike in almost every other computer application, in this kind of sentiment analysis, capitalization matters. If somebody types a, Twitter, a tweet all in caps, they're shouting. And so that's, uh, it, it intensifies. So that's one of the features that gets extracted. And, and so what you're doing, if you go back here in the tokenization, you're tokenizing and adding a little bit of it, additional data through tagging. We'll get to that in a second. Through tagging, that then is used by the feature extraction step to annotate the text. So you also have to look for things like phone numbers and dates and emoticons and so on. If you're interested, I gave two links here on the left-hand side to Chris Spots and Brendan O'Connor's um, tokenizer. You can go check those out if you're interested in that or if you want to use them for your, um, for your project. So this is just a, an easy example from the POTS emoticon recognizer. <clears throat> so either you have to recognize emojis, you know, like the poop icon, right? That's an important one. 
uh, or the, the laughing face icon uh, emoji. Those are important things. But in the old days when we just had uh, emoticons, you would have to write regular expressions like this, these things on the left-hand side here. So these I'll recognize and then give tags or give text expressions because the, the classifiers don't work with this. They don't work with colon, uh, uh, left, right paren. They work with expressions in some sort of text format. <clears throat> so we've tokenized the input stream. We then label features. So for example, we want to label things like negation or negative expressions of affect. So for example, how do we label something like, I didn't like this movie? So it turns out you could label everything, but it turns out that uh, that's actually the better strategy. Earlier versions of, to of sentiment analysis only labeled the adjectives. But it turns out for handling short texts, like reviews and so on, labeling all of the features on all the terms works really well. So here's a short example. There's, a, there's some references on the left-hand side you can go look, look at if you're curious. But basically, this labeling step is almost always by adding features to particular terms. So in this text, I didn't like this movie but I, whatever. So this is a text fragment. The labeler will add things like this, uh, not underscore like, and, and not underscore this. So what happens is that the labeler looks at things like didn't, did not, and then extends the span of that not term over the next terms that are referred to. In this case, up to the comma. Okay? So you get not like, not this, not movie. This is an important step because it's basically, it's like a first pass analysis on the semantics of sentiment. And so it's telling the, the, the recognizer, the classifier, that the negative, at, the negative term extends over the span of this sentence fragment up to the comma. Okay, so basically what we're doing is partitioning the sentiment analysis work into the labeler so that the classifier can work on all this later. So, what would be the opposite of this? If, you, if the sentence fragment was something like, I completely love this movie, we would then tag those terms with POS underscore, meaning it's a positive sentiment. So the first phase of sentiment analysis is to extend the labeling to include these terms. So there's a lot of different, like I said, there's a lot of different methods you can use, but I want to point out a couple of things really quickly here. So one of the classifiers you can use is what's called multinomial naive Bayes. It's just naive Bayes or sort of multiple categories. But here's the basic idea. For lots of sentiment analysis, lots of opinion analysis, the occurrence of words matters more than the word frequency. So in other words, uh, you can see something like the word fantastic. It, it says a lot. It's a very positive term. But the fact that it occurs five times in a phrase may not say much more. So this takes that into account. And so one of the things we do is to do this kind of uh, uh, classification. We do When we're doing fact text analysis, we actually will... will start to classify these, these documents by, by topic. And one of the steps we can do is to do a fact extraction. We're not going to talk about this at all today. I just want to bring that up as this is another whole space of this kind of analysis that people do. So one of the things we talked about earlier was trying to classify texts in terms of whether or not they're positive or negative. That is, is it thumbs up or thumbs down? Again, it's complicated. So this multi-phase approach turns out to be really critical for handling cases like this. At the bottom, it says, the battery lasts two hours. The next sentence is, the battery only lasts two hours. So that only is a negative marker, negative sentiment marker. So this would be a thumbs down. Versus the last one, the battery lasts two hours, exclamation point. Here, the exclamation point is a positive marker. 
this is one of the things that you know we've learned in the past you know uh, 20 years because previous linguistic analysis never considered those kinds of signifiers the exclamation point the question mark of course now we live in an interesting world where we have signifiers like stars or thumbs down or emojis so the problem that arises, though, is people will classify a movie or a product in terms of number of stars, five stars or one star. But then they will be out of agreement. I hated this movie, but I gave it five stars. What? <laughs> or I love this movie, but I only give it one star. We see this kind of thing all the time. Generally speaking, the way to deal with this is to throw this data point out because it's clear that they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> And so when you get an egregious error like that, that's a, a reason to exclude it because it's just internally contradictory. Notice that you don't do this within the text because sometimes you'll get texts that disagree within it, but that's a different thing. When you get internal variance within a block of text, it usually means that it is expressing topic sentiment over multiple variables. This sentence here, the food was great, but the service was terrible, and the music was too loud. Fine. That's three different factors, three different variables that are being talked about. Food, service, and music. So when we extract these different kinds of sentiments, you have to identify the target of the sentiment. So this sentence alone has three different targets for the product. So uh, a little bit of math here real quick. Because an important concept is uh, what's called T TFIDF. So it's, it stands for Term Frequency Inverse Document Frequency. And this little, this little chart here shows you uh, what I mean. So Inverse Document Frequency, this that IDF term right here, says given a term T on a document D, so let's say this is my email to you about the project, and we're looking for a term like, you know, good. Okay, so this is a measure of, uh, is basically the log of the number of words in the document and how often in that document this term appears, divided, and so that becomes the, the denominator here, how often that particular term occurs. And then when you weight it with term frequency, you go look at the word term frequency, so this is how often this term appears in a large set, so say all of German or all of English. Okay, so this is the relative frequency of the term, and you multiply this times the IDF, and it gives you this TF-IDF score. This is important because this is used in almost every single recommender system, almost every single sentiment analysis system in the world. So you'll hear this term TF-IDF, and it's just this formula, set of formulas right here. It's just saying that the value of a term increases proportional to the number of times it appears in the document, but it's reduced by the frequency of the word in the larger corpus. So very common words like project are useful, but they're not as important because they will be repeated many, many times within a document, as opposed to a term like terrible, which is relatively rare in a document. So it, it, the value of terrible goes up, the value of project goes down. So this is just a weighting scheme. Uh, our text for today <laughs> includes this really interesting concept, hapax legomena, which is just basically a very funny way of saying words that occur only, words or phrases that only occur once in a document. So by TFIDF, because remember this, you can do TFIDF scores for noun phrases as well. So here below in this blurry section, the blurry is important because here we have a unique phrase, noun phrase, Mediterranean climate. That occurs only once in this long article about uh, Los Angeles. So I grew up in LA. I know it has Mediterranean climate, but if you didn't grow up there, this single appearance of this term is heavily important. This is true for sentiment analysis as well. We know that when people write, they often will write in a way to emphasize the key concepts, and this is what Hapax Legomena means. So these are some of the heuristics that people build into their sentiment analysis tools. So one tool that's commonly used is this tool we've, we've mentioned before, but I don't think I've given you a pointer to it, called Luke, or it's, that's the way we pronounce it. 
Um, it actually stands for Linguistic Inquiry Word Count. And it's just a, a not quite freeware. Um, I think there actually is an academic free, freeware version of it. Go check the website if you're interested. It basically is a tool you can use to pour in text, and it will give you affective, emotional responses, and so on. This is not quite sentiment analysis, but it's probably the most used tool that people use in their kind of sentiment analytic work. This is primarily used in the academic context. It's not used a lot in, in industry, but it's very, very frequently used, and it's worth knowing about. So if you're interested in this, just go check out their website. It's a beautiful, beautifully done, somewhat linguistic approach to this, but it's, it's, it's cool. It's basically word counting with respect to a giant sort of back-end database they have of, of words and their classifications in context. Okay, we're almost we're almost done to the, for this section, um, but I want to I want to come back to this notion about finding the target of a complex utterance. So remember the um, the service was great, but the food was terrible and the music was too loud. Remember that. Here, this is um, that's finding the target or finding the attributes to those targets. One way to do this is to search throughout the document for frequent phrases. Now. A lot of sentiment systems, then you can see the papers on the left-hand side, a lot of sentiment analysis systems have rules that say when you find this phrase, then look for the target of that phrase within that sentence. So, for example, um, you might say, uh, great fish tacos, blah, 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 can be found at Rubio's, name of a restaurant in L.A., right? So what you're looking for are the, the sort of fundamental variables food or fish tacos or, as you see in the table here, the, the conceptual category is Greek restaurant, but terms that are used to describe Greek restaurants are things like food, wine, service, appetizers, lamb, so on. Those are all objects that when you see it in the text, you know what it's referring to. So this is, in a sense, capturing that real-world knowledge we talked about before. So the way we represent real-world knowledge in sentiment and opinion and analysis systems is by having rules. Now, the bad news is that this is not super generalizable. The good news is, by writing a set of rules like this, we can capture enough of the real-world knowledge within a domain that we get most of it right. So average systems run at 85%. And the 15% that we can't understand, mostly just throw that out, and it's okay. You're not getting a super hyper-accurate uh, sentiment analysis, but it's good enough. Okay. So these targets, um, like I said, may not be in the sentence, but they're going to be somewhere in the paragraph or the document. So the best approach that people use these days is what's called supervised classification. What this means, this is a machine learning technique, where you take a bunch of restaurant reviews, or reviews of whatever category, and you hand label them. So remember this? For the casino, you get buffet, pool, resort, beds, all that, right? We build a hand labeled corpus as our training data. So for example, for restaurant reviews, we talk about food, decor, service, music, ambiance, you know, so on. We then train a classifier that, given a sentence, takes those aspects and maps it to a particular value, extracted from the data. Okay, let me close on, on one, one quick comment, and then we'll, we'll go to our next uh, topic for today. The thing to remember is that, and, and this is not get talked about in most discussions, um, but this is a comment I, I pulled from Wikipedia. Because it's important for, especially for people in EU. Um, it turns out the EU copyright database says that the mining of in copyright texts, such as mining the sentiment from web pages, is without the permission of the copyright owner, is illegal. Okay, that's interesting. Um, and it's currently under discussion. That's what these next couple of paragraphs are about. So it's basically there's a huge, you know, regulatory fight going on in Europe about this. And so it's the kind of thing that if you start doing something professionally for sentiment mining where you're mining out the content or analyzing the content of web pages, you got to think about it. Um, I don't know what the rule is in Switzerland. 
but I know in the UK and in Germany, it's kind of a problematic mess. Now, in the US, it's the US, so it's the Wild West. Um, we have pre-existing uh, law that says that this is actually okay. You can do that kind of analysis because in US copyright law, it's called transformative. That's the magic word. It's transformative and therefore it's legal. And this is all part of the Google Books Agreement, so you're welcome. <laughs> now the cool thing for you is if you analyze in your project, for academic purposes, you're okay. Don't worry. So every project that we're doing for our class, we don't have to worry about this. And in particular, uh, if you're doing Twitter, you know, that's really, a, it's a U.S.-based company. You're under, therefore under U.S. copyright law, I think. It's a little bit funny because this, is, this law has not been tested. So I believe that if you analyze the Twitter data stream, you're fine. I, because it's for academic purposes, you're not going to be the test case. <laughs> Don't worry about it. But anyway, I just, I just found this whole area fascinating because I never would have dreamed that this would have been something we have to teach about in our course on sentiment analysis. Okay, last slide.